sermon. Last night's sermon was uh, the thing, yeah, the Leviathan. You, you're going to say, what's that all about? Yeah, get it? You'll learn. You'll know. I'm not going to spoil it because you have to get to the end of the sermon to find out what it's all about. But you take a beautiful journey for that. You can get that. And then also today's sermon, which is a surprise. We don't know what it will be at this point. In the today's sermon, all three of these for $5. Okay, Morgan's been working hard. Morgan's been working very hard getting the, getting the CDs together so you can get the CDs, so you can listen to It's more important to us that you get fed again and again and again. So uh, you can pick those up after the service and in the back and uh, be ministered to. I was telling several people last night, you know, it's one of those things that you need to get it and you need to listen to it over and over because isn't it amazing? You, you hear one thing and you're like, oh man, that's awesome. Then you hear the next thing, you forgot about the first thing that was awesome, you're on to the second thing that's awesome. And our minds are set up so that we just kind of remember the last thing that was awesome that was said. And we got to kind of rummage through our notes and, and get back to, and, and you want to hear these things over and over because they'll just feed your soul. And last night we came down the front and ministered to the just emotional healing that happened here last night. It was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I felt lighter. I felt like I was floating. I felt like I wasn't on anything. I was just on Jesus. So uh, I encourage you to, to get the, the, the sermon notes. Um, somebody had mentioned to me that, uh, I think it was Brother Mitchell, somebody had mentioned to me that, you know, his style is more of a teaching style. I'll be a little bit more like your style. But after, when he started on night one, I was like, hey, man, that's not my style. That, that's straight up good old-fashioned Holy Ghost preaching, you know, and I was like, I'm, I'm all over that. Um, but uh, I appreciate uh, so much. Uh, I feel like we've developed a great relationship and friendship. This church has connected and bonded well with uh, Dr. Jeffers all the way from, uh, come all the way out here from, flew in from London uh, to minister to us this weekend. And uh, as I told you before, he made it very clear to me when I asked him the first time. You know, I, I just, I'm not into opportunity. And I'm not an opportunist. If, if God wants me to step through the door, God's going to have to speak. And, and uh, so, but he felt it. And as, as we approached this weekend, we had so many things going on with hurts and things going on. And I was just like, oh, Lord. Yeah. It's never right to tell an evangelist the week before that, you know, I'm sorry we can't do this because we've had so many situations. It's never right to do that to an evangelist. I know that. But I was feeling so burdened. I had no idea what God had in store. I was in the thick of it. I was like. <laughs> so just out of church polity and, and the thing that I knew was right to do, I said, well, come on. I'm not sure, you know, what will happen. But, and lo and behold, <laughs> God had his timing, impeccable timing. I've had many of you come up to me. This weekend, say, God spoke to me. God dealt with me. Um, I needed this. I was hurting. I was aching. I needed this in the worst kind of way. I did not need to sit at home and lick wounds. I needed to get out and let the Word of God do something in me. And uh, I want to say that, uh, uh, Dr. Jeffers, thank you so much for coming, ministering, not preaching at us, ministering to us, healing, healing us. And uh, thank you so much. Hey, let's give them a 11 a.m. San Francisco Lighthouse. Welcome all the way from Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Gerald Jeffers. Come on and clap your hands unto the Lord and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Give him praise because he's worthy. Hallelujah. Get your Bibles as you remain standing in honor to the word of the Lord this morning. We are so grateful that God has permitted us to be here with you. When the pastor had conveyed the, some of the difficulties that were transpiring, the Lord had already spoken to me before even knowing this, the details that... He was going to do something unusual in this house. He said he was positioning this church for some deeper things. For oh God, and then when I heard about the, once getting here, hearing about the opportunity that flowed out for Tuesday night, 
I see God's not wasting any time. He knows how to do a quick work, and for that we are grateful. Matthew chapter 18, we are reading today, Matthew chapter 18. We honor the shepherd of this house. Somebody thank God for Dr. Garner, for Sister Garner. We thank God for them. Appreciate their vision and their love for the things of God. So good to have Brother Tim Miller here with us. Hey man from Stockton. Known Brother Tim for a long time and thank God for him. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to look at verse 7. I have read this scripture, read this scripture, read this scripture. You know, there are things you can look over and over again throughout the years with God. And then the Spirit of the Lord just, it's like he puts a light on a particular verse and causes it to come to your attention in a different way. Verse 7, would you read it out loud with me? Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense... Let's read it one more time. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom... I don't know if you caught what Jesus said. He said it must needs be that offenses come. Jesus says it is necessary that you become offended. I understand that you don't want to shout. Don't worry about it. He said, it must, needs be. It's a very emphatic statement that offenses come to you. Now, here comes the question in conjunction with the scripture. How do you handle it? How do you handle it? Because it's not a question of offenses coming or not coming. It's going to come. It, they're promised to you. The real then question is, how do you handle it? Depending on how you handle your offenses will determine whether you are promoted or demoted. If you will learn how to handle your offenses, God can elevate you and use you. Would you lift your hands in the sanctuary and open up your mouth unto your God? Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Now, Father, let your children hear their Father's voice, being your voice. God, that as all creation responds to your voice, may your children recognize and respond to your voice. We thank you now for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for a clear word, for revelation, for understanding. And we thank you for empowering us to perform those things you have caused us or that you're causing us to hear. For this we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, give someone a high five and tell them, I'm armed and dangerous. I'm armed with prayer, I'm armed with the word of God, I'm armed with a song, I'm armed with a shout, I'm armed with a testimony, and I'm dangerous to the devil. Once again, you're going to need to follow us through scripture because there's just understandings that by the help of God, the Lord is going to help us to grasp and gain hold of the things that he's saying. The first thing we need to begin to look at is the book of First Peter, chapter four. First Peter, chapter four. Um, in fact, I tell you before we look at Peter, let, let's look at Job a moment. All right, let's establish just a few things before we get to Peter. Go to Job, uh, uh, sometimes called Job, uh, chapter fourteen, and um, listen to what he says in verse one. Chapter fourteen, verse one. He simply says this, a man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So he said anyone that comes through the doorways of life, which is a woman, you are promised trouble. 
you are promised difficulties of life. Right? And now let, let, let's go a little further. Let's come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Now Paul is going to pick it up and make it even a little more specific. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. And Paul says to Timothy, his spiritual son, he says, And ye those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So Paul said, I don't want you to get the idea that just because you're living for God, you're not going to have any problems. Uh, that is one of the dangers. We must be very careful that we do not market Christianity in the manner of once you come to God, all of your problems are over. Your promise problems. Your promise difficulties. Write down the very simplistic things. Science, one of the things that science ran into, one of the challenges that science ran into, is when they sent men into space, there was no gravity, which means there was nothing to resist, which means there was no pressure. They found out that when the astronauts were staying in this non-pressure environment for long periods of time, that they were actually beginning to deteriorate their muscles because there was no resistance. See, for you even to walk, you must push against gravity, which in essence keeps you moving. If you decide that you're going to save your arm and you tie it to your side and don't use it, you say, by not using it, I'm going to preserve it. By not putting any resistance on it, I'm going to preserve it. You would actually discover in a few months you wouldn't be able to use it at all. You must have pressure in order to have performance. Now, as much as we may not like pressure, pressure is necessary. It is needful. Pressure and stress are needful elements of life. The problem is not having pressure and stress. The problem is how you handle it. Uh, simplistically put, uh, they teach us that lifting weights, uh, how much you lift is not the problem. It's how you lift. If you lift it with your back, you're going to hurt yourself. If you lift it with your knees, you will actually build your muscle. So then, same thing with God. Lifting things with your back symbolizes trying to lift things in your own strength. You're going to hurt yourself. But if you lift it with your knees, which symbolizes prayer, you're going to build yourself. See, everyone needs to graduate from God's university, and one of the degrees you need is a KO degree. It's a degree that allows you to knock out the devil because it's a degree in neology. You need a degree in neology. Oh, and by the way, you need first, before you get to that degree, you need a BA degree. A BA degree not meaning a bad attitude, but BA meaning born again. You need a BA degree first. Then you come further in God and you finally come to get your DD degree, which has become a devil disturber. Something's wrong if the devil can be comfortable around you. And so you advance in God, you grow through adversity. God's university is the school of adversity. You must graduate. Touch your neighbor, say you need to graduate. You need to graduate. And so God is moving to teach us how to handle things. See, our prayer many times is God move it. God's prayer is I've never heard so much from you since it came. He said, my goodness. You see, a prayerless saint is like a pit bull with AIDS. You are deadly. You are contagious. Why? Because you are not governed. You are not regulated. You must understand that what happens in the natural is a parallel of the spiritual. What AIDS is, is a breakdown of the immunity system. It is the decomposing of the immunity system that has not allow your body to hold back against things it normally can fend off. Like a common cold walks in, now kills you. Whereby your body would have no problem deterring the cold. 
Well, you see, this first happened in the supernatural realm, where there was an attack against the blood of Jesus Christ, where even in the Christian world, blood songs were being taken out of hymn books, and people were beginning to decompose the defense system of God against the things that would ward us off from sin. So now what God is doing is raising back up a people and strengthening them, causing them to understand who they are and letting them walk in the fullness of their authority. Somebody thank God for that. Come to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 now. Now we can look at Peter because, and if you haven't swallowed already, you need to. Um, 1 Peter chapter 4 because this is something that when we read, you must get God's mentality on things. May I tell you this first? Some years ago, I just found myself in trial after trial after trial after trial. There's sometimes you run what we call the spiritual obstacle course. Uh, you got to run through the tires, swing over the pond, climb up the wall, you know, jump over the hurdles. In other words, you hit one trial after the next trial after the next trial without any kind of break. And you know, the problem with an obstacle course is not that these, any, these one things are difficult by themselves. It's the combination that causes you to trip up and fall. And so it is trial after trial after trial after trial after trial. The purpose is to cause you to trip up in your faith and fall. And so I was in one of those kind of situations where everything was going wrong. And sometimes you want to look at God and go, do you hate me? <laughs> Are you mad at me? <laughs> Something wrong? Did I upset you? <laughs> Please tell me. I'll get it right. <laughs> and the Lord spoke back to me and he said, see, you have to think like me to walk with me. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Duh. Not agree, agreed. Duh. Agreed means that you agree with me first, walk with me afterwards. Agree would imply we agree as we walk. God said, I don't take one step with you till you agree with me first. Now you're empowered to walk. So God said, now I need you to get my understanding. He said, you're seeing this as punishment because you're having difficulty. He said, that's not how I see it. He said, let me tell you how I see it. It is illegal, both naturally and spiritually, to become intimate with a child. He said, you're still a little child, and I'm anxious to get intimate with you, and the way to mature you is by fire. So I have allowed an increase of fire in your life to mature you so that I may become intimate with you. So it's not a punishment, it's a privilege. Somebody tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You've got to be careful now that you don't look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. Somebody just smiles. Because what God wants you to recognize is walking with God does not mean you're not going to have difficulty. You're going to have trials. You're going to have difficulty of life. But God must teach you how to handle things. Now, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I need you to hear this in the Amplified Version of the Bible because it's going to really help do what it says, amplify it, magnify, break some things apart, and give us understanding. It says, so, since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, for you, arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose, patiently to suffer rather than fail to please God. For whoever has suffered in the flesh having the mind of Christ is done with intentional sin, has stopped pleasing himself and the world and pleases God. The reason why God allows you to go through difficulty is to teach you to stop pleasing yourself. All right, you do the same thing as parents, as, as guardians. You tell a child, don't do something because you don't want them hurt. But sometimes, they, sometimes you know they're going to do it. They go ahead and do it. So sometimes you just let them touch that little hot thing lightly. One little burn teaches them never touch that again. They learn obedience sometimes through the things which they suffer. It's not what you want them to do, but as sometimes you know, there's no other way to deter them from doing it. And so it is with God. God sometimes has to allow some stuff to happen to you to teach you that you ain't as smart as you think you are. Now, I know you think you all that and a bag of chips. I know you think you the main meal and the snack on the side. So God just got to teach you, you ain't all that. 
Sometimes how he teaches you that is by simply letting you go through something where you're clueless. You know, I really thought I could have handled this, but now that it's happened, I- I'm struggling. I- I- I'm, I'm, I'm drowning. And God's going, are you ready to ask for help now? Because your power is in your dependency. Have you ever done that with a little child? Children, sometimes you go, they're trying to tie their shoes. Well, let me show you, honey. I want to do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> little fingers are struggling. They're trying to make the bow. They can't make it. They're getting frustrated. All you can do is ask for help. Shake their little head, pout their face, and keep trying to do it. And you see them struggling and struggling all because they won't ask for help. So God sometimes got to bring you to a point where you learn how to ask for help. Some of you are too proud to ask for help. I don't need nobody. Listen, every Superman got kryptonite, baby. Every Superman got kryptonite. You hear me? You got some kryptonite somewhere. So God's got to make you realize that the only one that is invincible is God. One of the problems that happens to young people, particularly particularly young men, is this feeling of invincibility. Strong, robust, nothing taking me down. I can, you know, do what I want to do. And so God's got to let some stuff happen. Sometimes some simple things. You're out playing basketball, you sprain your leg. All of a sudden, can't walk. Kind of clicks. I'm not as strong as I thought I was. God lets some stuff. He has to allow. Better say allow. All right, so he has to allow some things to happen in order to bring you to a area of understanding with him. Now, listen to verse 2. So that he can no longer spend the rest of his natural life living by his human appetites and desires, but he lives for what God wills. In other words, God sometimes has to, watch this, you, you do this sometimes. You know, children will want to eat candy all day long if you let them. And, and they think, in fact, that you're mean for not giving it to them. God said, now, now you understand what happens between you and I. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. And it went over like a lead balloon. All right. Yeah. So let me put it to you another way. Babies are attracted to light. Babies are very fascinated with light when they're first born. It is one of the things that catches automatically a baby's eye is light. And so anything that reflects light, they tend to want it. So they'll see an object and they'll reach for it because it's reflecting light. You won't give them the object. Why? They don't see the cutting edge of the knife. All they see is the light coming off the metal. And see, that's what happens to a lot of you. All you can see is if I would get this thing, how glorious and beautiful, how much light it would bring to my life. And you don't see the cutting edge of the damage it could do to you. So God withholds it from you. And you end up screaming and crying like a baby. Some of you end up throwing spiritual temper tantrums. You know what a baby does by throwing a temper tantrum? I'm going to hold my breath. Well, this is what some people do. The Bible says, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So then you end up holding your praise. Because I'm not getting what I want and I don't understand why I'm not getting it. But this is where God says, I need you to trust me that if I didn't give it to you, it's because it wasn't what was best for you. I know you may not understand. I know you may have wanted to work another way. I know you may have wished something would have transpired. I will never forget we had a situation where a loved one, someone died, and we began to seek the face of the Lord because just something just didn't seem right. God, why did you let this person go? And the Lord began to open up understanding, and it was really after they died, other things began to materialize, and people began to step forward and said they were beginning to wander off the pathway. Certain things were starting to happen, and the Lord had already spoken. We, I took them home because if I let them stay, they would not have stayed living for me. So I took them home while they were still living for me so they could live with me forever rather than let them stay in the earth and wander away from me and not be with me forever. You may not understand it, but he's wiser than you. Somebody lift your hands again to him right now. Somebody open up your mouth to him because he's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Open our understanding. Open our understanding. Open open our understanding. 
You need to come to the book of Revelation now, Revelation chapter 4. Revelation, I want you to realize that there's no S on the end of the book because the entire book is one revelation unfolding itself all about the aspects of Jesus Christ. But there is a key revelation that is in the book of Revelation that we need here at this time. Chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. Can I tell you what all of us are struggling with? Selfishness. This is why we're called the children of God. Because inherently I want what I want. And I don't like it when I don't get what I want. And I can get real moody and irritable. See what happens to some of you, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed even though your bed's up against the wall. Uh, only one way for you to get out and it's always the wrong side of the bed. It, it, it's because there's, there are things that God is trying to work with you and teach you. It's not all about you. It's not about getting what you want. I know you wanted it to work this way. I know you wanted it to go that way. But you must trust me that I know what is best for you and I will lead you. A God that died for you is now not going to take you down the worst path that's going to be worse for you. If he allows you to go down the path, it is because he has foreordained this is the best path for you to become who he foreordained you to be. So when you understand that, you can walk down the path and even though it's a bumpy road, you can tell God, thank you. For I know you're going to work it out for me. For rather than it destroying me, you're going to make it develop me. See, again, to lift weights incorrectly is to tear your muscle. To lift them correctly is to build your muscle. So this is why God allows you to have problems because you get in his spiritual gym and you've got to learn how to resist things. You don't start off lifting 200 pounds. You will end up with a hernia. You will hurt yourself. And this is why a lot of you, you're trying to lift things with your faith and you end up with a spiritual hernia. You're trying to lift a mortgage payment or a car payment or you're trying to lift a very serious emotional wound and you end up with a hernia. You must learn how to lift 10 pounds 20 times. Repetition is the key to building the muscle and so it is emotionally. God keeps letting you deal with that same problem again and again and again and you're like, when is this thing going to get out of my face? God says, no, you need to lift that again. Lift that again. Lift why? Because it is building your muscle. It is building your character. It is developing you. I know you want it out of your face, but it's making you. <sighs> Somebody needs to tell him thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, can, I, can I just tell you what makes a parent a parent? Parent. P A R E N T. P A Y R E N T. A parent pays rent. The word rent is in parent. A parent pays. <laughs> From even before the child is born, the parent is paying. Come on, mothers. Some mothers, some mother, one mother told me, I will be so, I, should, I never thought I would miss my feet. I ain't seen my feet in months. I don't know what they look like. One told me how they were laying in the middle of the bed and they said they felt like a beached whale. They couldn't get out of the bed. They couldn't roll. Their stomach would not allow them to roll over. A parent starts paying from the beginning. When the child is born and the child keeps the parents up late at night and cries and demands, their whole life is changed around because of the baby. A parent pays. I was sharing with Dr. Garner that USA Today published uh, some findings or statistics about five years ago stating that to pay for a child from the first year of the crib or from the crib right to the college, not paying for college, but the age of college or university, cost a parent over $300,000 per child. That is not paying for any luxuries, any vacations or anything. Use this expensive people. Kids, kids, kids are expensive. I don't care, even, even if you seem like you're a little bit below poverty line, kids are expensive. Parents pay. This is why we sing an old song, Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. He is the ultimate parent because he paid a debt that I owed that I couldn't pay.
You know how we tell children sometimes when they get to be teenagers, and, and believe me, there's something biblical to teenagers having problems. The number 13, which we call numerology, which is the study of numbers, the number 13 in the Bible stands for rebellion and for apostasy. Apostasy means to fall away from the truth. That's why in the teen years, your teenager oftentimes starts falling away from those things you taught them. That's apostasy. They fall away from truth. But right in the middle of the teen years is the number 15. The number 15 is 5 times 3. 5 is grace. 3 is divine completeness. God puts complete grace right in the teen years so that everybody survives. <laughs> <laughs> Tell God thank you. <laughs> so, so God wants you to understand. See, God wants you to understand. This is why even when we, we when deal with children, deal with teenagers, teenagers come to the point where they want to exercise their individuality. I want to make decisions. I want to. Uh, I want to be on my own. I want independence. Well, one of the, the the key things that we tell them is that maturity is proven by responsibility. When you can officially take care of yourself and take care of your own needs without my help, then I don't have to give you any more decisions. I don't have to guide you. But as long as I got to pay for you. <laughs> you ain't grown. I don't care if you are 18. <laughs> Now, now, see, it's with the same understanding God is always paying for us. He's all, you're never grown when it comes to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this is what God is training us. We, we are his children. But the Bible calls us the children of God. We're a child of God. We're the sons of God. And, and therefore, he is our parent. He's training us through difficulties and trials how to become like him. Now, let's come to Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, what? And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. Thy pleasure means for thy will. So God said, your children are created for my will. Not for them to live out your thing that you didn't get to do. They are created for my will. And you are created for my will. Mm -hmm. So now here comes the struggle. The struggle comes in because I have a will and I want to do some stuff that I want to do. The problem is I'm not as knowledgeable as I think I am. Now, when I graduated my doctor degree, you see, God's got to show you stuff. God's got to show you. When I got my doctor degree, have Bible, will travel, let's go God. God was like, whoa, whoa, slow your roll. We got to get some things clear first before you go out there. So the next thing I knew, I was in a graveyard digging ditches. And I was talking to the Lord one day by doing this landscaping and digging ditches. I said, this is not exactly what I had in mind. I have a doctor degree and I am getting blisters with shovels. This is, something's not working out here. It wasn't exactly what I had planned. God said, I am using your degree. You have a PhD, professional hole digger. God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> Where do you think you got it from? <laughs> Otherwise, what God was trying to say is, I don't need your degree. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need your sermon. I don't need you to put stuff together for me and tell me and word it how to say it. I don't need you to set up a Roman road to tell to witness to somebody. I just need you to obey me and understand that you were made for me. Somebody shout, I was made for God. Now what that means is I was not made for marriage. I was not made for children. I was not made for a job. I was made for God. Which means there are times when God, I know you're not going to, I'm leaving, this is hit and run, I'm leaving y'all. This is our times, there are times when God is going to tell you no, just like you would tell a child no. God's going to tell you no. And do you know why sometimes God tells you no? It's not always because he doesn't want to give it to you, but it is to try your spirit. 
how are you going to respond? Are you in control of your character? Or are you a person that can't control yourself when you can't get what you want? Because if I can't trust you to control you, I can't use you. Hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Y'all gonna make me work some word up in here. All right, so look at this because uh, you, you, you got to see this. You got to see this because God is an amazing God. We, we sometimes, unfortunately, particularly in America, we have confused God with Santa Claus. We really have because sometimes we just look to make out our Christmas wish list to God in the form of prayer and we just don't read it, God, just answer it. Just, just give it. <laughs> And what God is saying is, I love you, and I love you enough not to always give you what you think you need. Yeah, I, I love you enough that I'm not going to just hand you everything sweet. You know what happens when kids keep eating everything sweet? Their teeth rots. They get sick. Do you know what happens when God keeps giving you everything sweet? You lose resilience. You can't chew meat. You can't deal with difficulties of life. Sunshine all the time creates a desert. You must have a storm. You must have dark clouds. You must have rain. And when I told you last night, when the Lord took me to Jamaica for three months, he took me during the rainy season. And the rainy season of Jamaica, it was so hard. The rain was so hard that you could not see from here right to the front. Uh, right to this front row. You had to pull your cars over. It was just like a wall of rain that dropped. And it would drop like that way for five or ten minutes. And then all of a sudden they would just stop. And everything would just open up and become greener and brighter. And you thought, this is how Jamaica is so beautiful. It is not the heat in itself that makes it beautiful. It's the storm. And these storms were unpredictable. You didn't know it was going to rain. It wasn't like a few little drops to warn you. It just came down like a flash flood. And no matter where you were, if you had an umbrella, it was, it was useless. Because you were going to get soaked regardless. This is what God does. All of a sudden, God just lets a storm hit your life. Boom. There it is. God just let it hit you. And you're like, what's going on here? God said, I'm causing something to grow inside of <sighs> You can't grow with everything being sweet. You can't grow with everything just being nice. Hallelujah. Now remember the principle. Jesus said in St. John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said, except a grain of wheat go in the ground and die, it abides alone. He said, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So now when God wants to make you watch the principle, God puts things in life to teach you about what you're going to go through. So God says, I put a seed of destiny inside of you. How do I make a seed grow? The first thing you do is bury it. So the next thing you know, you are buried under problems. You do not see the light of the S-O-N anymore. You are buried. Everything is dark. Darkness speaks of confusion, lack of understanding. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. You are totally clueless. And you are buried feeling the pressure of the weight of things on top of you. The next thing that has to happen is you must water the seed. For the water cracks the hard outer shell to release the inner life. So the next thing you know when you're under pressure, you start to cry. And your tears are watering your destiny. It is cracking the hard outer shell of your will to release the inner life of God. This is why the Bible said, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Everybody wants the joy. Nobody wants the tears. Weeping may endure for night, but joy comes in the morning. You don't get the joy in the morning until you've had the night of crying. It's a principle of life. God put it in all facets of life to teach us. Because it's all about learning how to handle it correctly. You can't handle it unless you understand. And that's why we have to give the understandings first. God put this principle in life. You see, if a woman comes to a medical doctor and says, I'm having pain, I'm, I'm in travail. And the first thing the doctor is going to ask is, how far apart are your contractions? Contractions 
are your muscles pulling in order to push the baby out? If you tell the doctor they're 12 minutes apart, he's going to, look, I'm going sightseeing. I'm going to, I'm going golfing. You call me later. You know what he's telling the woman? You have too much rest in between your pain. You're not ready to deliver anything. And when you got too much rest in between your pain, you're not in position to give forth anything. It's when she says the contractions are coming at five minutes or less. He says, get in the birthing position. Because it's when pain is on top of pain, on top of pain. Get ready for when Zion travails, she shall bring forth. Now you're ready to bring forth something. It is when it is when she's laying there and feeling like an earthquake in her body, looking over at the monitor as if it was a Richter scale that is amen charging or saying where she's at in her pain. It is when she's at this position, when she's hurting and she's screaming and she goes through all these kind of changes where she has her husband or the person she loves beside her, she's grabbing their hand, they testify, I never knew she had such a tight grip. Oh. Mm. Because when you're first in pain, honey, the first thing you need to do is grab hold to his unchanging hand. Oh, Jesus. It's not a time to run from God. It's a time to run to God. But then what happens is she looks at her husband and says, this is your fault. Don't you ever touch me again. We're getting separate bedrooms. And this is what happens at first between you and God because you begin to realize the reason why I'm having this pain is because I obeyed you. The reason why I'm having this pain is because I walked the road you told me to walk. I don't want you to give me another prophecy. I don't want you to give me another vision. I don't want you to tell me another thing to do because I don't want this pain. But while she's in that tremendous pain, listen, the doctor doesn't come by and pat her and say, poor baby. He says, push. I know you're in pain, but push. P-U-S-H, pray until something happens. Praise until something happens. When you're in pain, it's time to pray. It's time to praise until something happens. Somebody shout hallelujah in this house. Oh God. I have a word from the Lord because God said why some people are not growing is because you always run from pain. As soon as there's difficulty, as soon as there's trials, as soon as you're in the fire, you look for the fire exit. As soon as something's not the way you want it, you want out. And you met yesterday. Because some of y'all got God confused with Burger King. Have it your way. No, baby. Sorry. You ain't stacking this up your way. Some of you want to go up to the drive through window of heaven. Tell God what you want. And by the next window, it ought to be piping hot and ready. Or you're on your horn saying, God, where is it? But God said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength this is why God put the principles in the earth to show you do you understand when you deal with a baby you don't make babies wait when they cry you immediately are trying to find out what's wrong are they hungry are they wet you immediately try to tend to them but as they come out of the diaper stage and they begin to talk you now look into their cute little face and say wait a moment baby and as they get older, because first they think a minute is, you know, you try to explain to them, oh, we're going to go on a trip, and it's going to take us a long time, okay? They go, okay. And then and you get around the corner, are we there yet? <laughs> that was a long time for them, you understand? They sat five minutes, they're not used to that, that was a long time. <laughs> they thought they did real good, they almost five minutes. <laughs> 
you know, I, I'll give you, I'll give you this in a minute. And they tug on you in two seconds. Is a minute up yet? <laughs> and that's what happens between you and God. God says, I'll do it soon after a month. You go, is soon yet? Is it soon yet, God? Is it soon, is it soon yet? Because a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. So a month, you haven't even made a minute. And typical kid, is, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet, God? Is it? <laughs> Woo, good thing I'm leaving. Okay, so... <laughs> And so God said, now I got to teach you how to wait because see maturity, a mark of maturity is the ability to wait. If the child falls up their fists and stomps their feet and throws it, you teach them that's not how you wait. That's not proper waiting. Waiting is with a proper attitude. It's waiting patiently. The psalmist said, I waited patiently upon the Lord. So as they get older, they got to learn how to wait longer. Uh, when the summer draws near and they're excited about their first day of school, you got to wait a few months before school. You got to wait now. And you got to come. You can, now they get in school, they can't wait to get out of school. You're going to have to wait a few months. You're going to, you're going to have to wait. And you see, it, the minutes turn to months. You've got to learn how to wait longer. And now all of a sudden they want their driver's license. Now you're going to have to wait years. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait for years. And, and now even once you get to the chronological age that you can drive doesn't give you the authority to drive. Do you understand what the state says to you? You can go out and buy a car, insure the car, and don't have the authority to drive the car. It's your car, but you can't use it. God's the same way. God said you can come to a certain chronological age. You can have a ministry that belongs to you, but you don't have the authority to drive the ministry unless you pass certain tests. And it's not enough for you to pass the test. You got to pay for the test. And if you don't pass... They don't take the money you previously gave. They go, <laughs> you're paying again. <laughs> if you can't say amen, say amen. <laughs> now, I want you to see this because I, I need to close. Come to this. Come to the book of Ezekiel. And, and, and I want you to see this. Because God allows certain things to happen in our lives. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 24. Ezekiel chapter 24. God must teach you how to handle trials. He must teach you how to handle problems. He must teach you how to deal with losses. He must teach you how to deal with people hurting your feelings and rejecting you. What happens to some of you is you have a victim's mentality. No matter what happens, it's always poor me. It's always I get the cheap end of the stick. Nothing ever goes right for me. This is just my life, you know. It's just the way it is. God said he's got to grow you up past this. You must stop acting lower than a pregnant ant. God said, I got to pull you up because what I want to do is I got some great stuff for you. The stuff I really want to give to you. But just like a baby, you don't even give a baby a penny. Why? They'll choke on the penny and can die from a penny. A baby can drown in two inches of water. They're not mature enough to handle it. So the reason why God hasn't given some of you more money is not because he doesn't want to. But a penny will choke a baby. So you're not going to do that. The baby thinks you're mean. But you're not going to do that. That's the same thing with God. God goes, I see you struggle. I know you've got financial difficulty. But before I can solve the difficulty of your finances, i got to mature you to handle the money. Uh, uh. And how many understand that God's system of money is not winning the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes? It's... <laughs> It's not playing the lotto. God, 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 God. Some, some of y'all want to make deals with God. If I win the lottery, I'll give half the money to church. No, no, no. God don't need no. 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 God's not, God's not looking for that. See, that, that right there shows immaturity. Because you want to quickly get something that you're not mature enough to handle. Mm -hmm. So God wants to mature you. He wants to develop you. So that whatever he gives you, that your blessing remains a blessing and your blessing doesn't become a curse. Yes. Now, Ezekiel chapter 24, I want you to see this now. 
No, we, we, we're going to get real deep here. But you got to see this from the word of the Lord. Verse 15. And also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shall thou mourn nor weep, neither shall tears run down thy face. God said, I'm going to take something very important away from you. Don't cry when I do it. Hold on. Verse 17. But bear to cry, make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thy head upon thee. Put on the shoes upon thy feet. Cover not thy lips. Eat not the bread of men. Do not go through the natural ceremonies of mourning. Now God's not saying this to everybody. God was saying this to Ezekiel. But I want you to see why. Watch. Verse 18. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. Ezekiel had reached such a level of maturity with God that God could take away his wife. God could tell him, don't cry. And God could turn around and say, after she dies, get up and talk to my people and tell them that this is a sign and a symbol unto them that even as my wife died and I'm not allowed to cry, your captors shall come and take you away and they will kill your loved ones in front of your face and you will not be allowed to cry. Ezekiel, how many souls are you winning out of this? No one. Everybody's going into captivity. Not one soul was won by the loss of his wife. And why are you doing this? Maturity says I don't do it for ministry. I don't do it for souls. I do it because it pleases God. And God is maturing up a people in this house by fire through difficulties of life that God is going to build up your muscle and your character that when the devil comes up against to fight you, you look at the devil and say, I'm just like my daddy. I was preaching this in one place in Florida and this mother came up to me the next night and said, my five-year-old has been walking around the house saying that all day long. I'm just like my daddy. I'm just like my daddy. I said, oh, that's wonderful. She said, hold on. I got a two-year-old who loves to copy my five-year-old. And so she thinks she's saying what he's saying. And she's going around going, I'm going to slap my daddy. I'm going to slap my daddy. <laughs> And so God wants to develop you. God wants to develop you. God is not just simply trying to give you easy street. God's not just simply trying to make everything just a, a, a bowl of roses for you. And you got thorns with roses. You can, he's not just trying to give you peaches without pits. He, there's some difficulty things you're going to have to go through. Why? Not because he's mean, but because he wants to develop you. He wants to teach you how to handle things so that he can give you what he wants. In the book of Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. The Bible says an heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. God said, as long as you are immature, all that I have promised you, I can't give it to you. It's no different than what you would do with a child. You might have a family heirloom. You're not going to give it to a five-year-old. You're going to see how the child takes care of their clothes. If they, you buy them new clothes and then it's on the floor uh, you say you're not thankful you're not taking care of things therefore you're not ready for this family heirloom that's priceless when I see you're responsible when I see you've got maturity when I see I can trust you with things now I'll give you more and that is God before God's going to give you a miracle ministry before God's going to really let you touch people before you can really preach to people before you can sing and lead people into worship there must be fire there must be some dark clouds and in the darkness there must be the ability to lift your hands and open up your mouth and tell God though you slay me yet will I trust in you I know my redeemer lives you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him God said when I can see you're in fire and you're acting just like me then 
The story is told about a young man. The story is told about a young man, the silversmith. And a young man, he came to the silversmith. He was an apprentice. And he was trying to learn about how to use silver. And he came to the old man that had the white hair and had been in this job a long time and said to him, Sir, I can't tell when the silver is right to be used. The old man said, Let's fire up a pot of silver together and we'll determine when it's right to be used. The old man with his gray hair would look down into that pot and shake his hoary head and say no and, and the young man would say well how do you know and then he said looking down the pot he said come here look into that pot tell me what you see he said I see a perfect reflection of myself he said that's when you know the silver is right to be used when God can see you in fire and see a perfect reflection of himself God can see his character in you that's when he knows you're right to be used when God can can see there's fire and trial and people have lied on you and you're losing loved ones and stuff has happened and yet you can lift your hands and still give God praise. You attack spiritual forces and not people. Now God knows you're right to be used. Now God will raise you up. When you stop giving into that depression but you stop letting depression kick you all over your house and you go reach for your own oil and anoint the doorpost and tell depression you can't stay here we can't live together God said now I know you're right to be used somebody throw up your hands to God in this house he's maturing this church he's not punishing you he's maturing you so that he can give you what he wants to give you Some of you are going, I don't understand why me. The greater the destiny is the greater the pit. The greater the call on your life is the greater of the intensity of the flames. Come on, look at anybody that we look at in society. You don't just walk off and become a medical doctor. You gotta go through 12 years of schooling. Then you hit university. And you've gotta go through at least six years of university. And then if you specialize, you must go for another four or five years. Then you walk out with a degree. You don't just wake up and decide you're gonna be a doctor, a medical doctor. And if you try to be a medical doctor without the degree, you're impersonating. We got too many people that are impersonating saints. Your ain'ts, not saints. God said, I'm looking for somebody that's just not trying to just show up and have a little party. That's not just trying to show up and have a little fun and bounce around and feel good a little bit. He said, I'm looking for somebody that when they're at home and they're going through their job and things are going rough and somebody just cut them off in traffic and swore at them and acted like it was their problem. See, what happens to a lot of you, you lose your Holy Ghost when you drive. What happens is if somebody cuts you off and swears at you, yeah, you call them everything but their Christian name. And God said, God said, I want you to understand that I'm watching you. I'm wanting to develop your character. I'm wanting to mature you. When I can see someone can cut you off in traffic and yet you give me praise. And yet you say, thank you for keeping me because they could have hit me. Something could have gone wrong, but you kept me. When I see that you're maturing like this, he said, now I can get ready to use you. When I can see that I can put you in difficult situations of life and you don't get mad, angry at people. You don't blame yourself. You don't blame others, but you fight against spiritual forces being the enemy and you know how to open up your mouth and praise God and shake the core doors of hell you can be just like Paul and Silas locked up in prison with shackles all over you but you know how to open up your mouth and give God praise until God shakes the prison you can tell Elvis Presley sit down Jesus is the only jailhouse rocker he'll rock your prison He'll rock your jailhouse if you'll open up your mouth, even with your backs open, and start to give him praise. Somebody open up your mouth again in this house. 
Somebody begin to give him praise. Yes, she I must close with this testimony. You can stand, sit, that's up to you, friend. You're at liberty to move accordingly. But I was going through some very difficult times of my life some time back. And again, one of the first scriptures, the Bible says, there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. One of the first things the devil likes to try to take you through is to make you feel like you're the only one going through this. Friend, there's 6.7 billion people in the world. You are far from the only one going through this. And you don't have to look far to find somebody worse, much worse than you. I was reading a book called Tortured for His Faith, the story of Harlan Popoff when the Iron Curtain was still up in Europe. The Russian Iron Curtain, communist countries were established. The last force that Russia dealt with was the church. It is documented that Russia felt that the church was the greatest threat to communism. It was greater than any missiles. It was greater than any army. The church was the greatest threat. So they made sure the church was the last force they dealt with. In the middle of the night, at four in the morning, they came and knocked on this pastor's door, dragged him out of his house, his little girl, was just five years old. When he would see his little girl again, she was 18. Night after night, they beat them, they tortured them. He testifies that being locked up in a cell and taking a tin can and by Morse code, preaching the gospel to a cell block prisoner who he never met. And the person tapping back, saying, I accept what you say and I will pursue more of Jesus. Putting men in trenches that was only made for 35 people and putting 100 men down there having to go to bathroom in that place and having to eat their food there. And yet he begins to testify that even in the pit, he praised God. I began to recognize more and more that God was not just looking for someone that was a, a voodoo doll that took pins as in some sort of torture, but God was looking for somebody that simply says, I love you. And there's no trial and there's no test that will deter me from loving you. And even though things are coming my way and I don't understand it, I have determined that I'm going to love you and lift my voice to you. And that by your grace, you're going to mature me so that you can trust me with what you foreordained for me to have. And now, friends, it's up to you. If you want to come to the altar, you want to stay where you are, that's all up to you right now. But we just need a season of prayer. No music right now. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, singers. But we need a, just a season of prayer. We need a time of just seeking God's face. We need a time of saying to God, mature me. Help me. Teach me how to handle my trials. Help me not to murmur and complain. Help me to... Help me not to be a whiner that as soon as everything doesn't go right, help me to stop just giving into depression and self-pity every time I don't get what I want. Bring me out of these spiritual terrible twos. Do you understand what a child goes through with terrible twos? As soon as the parent leaves their sight, the child screams and feels like the parent is never coming back. God said, this is what some of you are going through. You are in your terrible twos. As soon as you don't feel God, as soon as you don't, the hair on the back of your neck doesn't go up. As soon as you don't get that feeling you once had with God's presence, you feel like God left you and you start screaming and crying like God is never coming back. 
God said, I'm only letting you go through this to mature you, mature you. Because when the child finally grows up, you can send them off to school for five to six hours and they know that you love them and they're secure in your love and they don't have to be in your presence always to know they have relationship with you. And that's the way it becomes with God. When babies start off, you love them, you kiss them, you hug them, you, you give them, give, 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 give love. But as they grow, you tell that child, come here, hug me, put your arms around me, squeeze me, say, I love you. And so what you'll do is you'll let them come and hug you. And sometimes you won't hug them back in order to teach them how to give love without always receiving it. And some of you don't understand that's what God's doing with you. He's been hugging you, kissing you, picking you up. But now it's time for you to grow up. When a child gets too big, you can't keep picking them up. They look at you, go, pick me up. You go, baby, I don't have a crane. You, you're too heavy now. You're too big now. Things got to change because you're growing. I can't keep you in diapers all the time. You've got to change. Some of you are afraid of changing. You're afraid of God changing his relationship with you. But God wants to teach you how to hug him even when he's not hugging you. One arm is praise. The other arm is worship. And love squeezes around a divine entity and holds God even when you don't feel God holding you. That's maturity. You're growing up. It's necessary for you to be who you are. He says, as you become an adult, you don't sit in your parents' lap anymore. Doesn't mean they don't love you. It means you just have a totally different relationship. <laughs> That's what's going on between you and God. He's growing you up. That he may give you what is rightfully yours that he bought on the cross. Would you lift your hands now and talk to him? Oh, Jesus. Grow me up. Mature me. Teach me how to handle my trials. Teach me. In the midst of the trial, teach me. me to be like you that in the midst of difficulty you can raise me up oh God Oh God, let me not only praise you in church, let me not only praise you when music is playing or a singer is singing, but let me praise you in my house, let me praise you in my car, let me praise you in school, let me praise you on my job Oh God, let me live the word of God. Raise me up. To be like you, to be like you, to be like you. Oh God, I know to be like you, I have to have a cross like you had a cross. But I also know I'll have a resurrection like you've had a resurrection. Hallelujah, teach me, teach me. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, that's it. Teach me. Help me, oh God. Yakuseki Baba 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 Hashe. That's right, that's right. Take your time, talk to him. Come on, you might not feel him at all, but hug him, hold him. <laughs> oh. 
God is as I've had to grow up naturally and learn responsibility. Let me grow up spiritually. We're just going to sing a worship song because it's time to go after God right now. <sighs> Friend, it's wonderful to lay hands on people to pray and I've got absolutely no problem with that. But I hear the Holy Ghost in this house saying, let them come to me on their own. Let them learn how to come to me. Because everybody's not going to be around you to be able to lay hands on you. You've got to learn by the help of God to make the effort and come after God. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my day. This is my day, Libre. You've
Hallelujah. 